Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Rob Noble, Livingston County Dairy Farmer and uh, current chair of the Farm Viability Institute. If you were able to attend our webinar last month, you learn more about the field of behavioral sciences and how it might apply to helping farmers adopt new practices. <clears throat> Today, we're focused on New York's apple industry. We'll hear from both a farmer and a researcher about their experience as New York apple growers transitioned to tall spindle planting systems. We also have a top line presentation of results from a survey farm viability conducted last summer to better understand apple growers research priorities. The apple grower who is speaking today is a familiar name and faced for many of you. Jim Bittner was one of the founding members of Farm Viability Institute and its chair for many years. That's why we thought Jim was the best person to share what he was hearing and seeing in the apple industry as Terrence Robinson sought funding to help farmers rethink the apple orchard. I wanna offer up my thanks to Jim and the 27 board members that preceded the current Farm Viability Board. I've been thinking about Farm Viability's history frequently as the current board seeks to navigate the financial challenges driven by state budget pressures. Significant effort by a number of people went into building the Farm Viability Organization and creating a model that helps connect state's ag research dollars to farmers' priorities. While our current situation is difficult, we are fortunate to have been supported by New York State all these years, and I'm optimistic that their support will continue. At last month's webinar, we learned that our focus on farmer involvement in the process is probably one of the reasons our projects succeed. Over the years, we've had hundreds of farmer review proposals. Farmers review the proposals and the work they have prioritized for funding has created knowledge that continues to benefit farmers today. Oh, these stories, these valuable projects are why New York's agricultural organizations continue to advocate for farm viability's funding year after year and why New York farmers are willing to serve on our review panels. And now for one of the farmers that started it all back in 2005, uh, let's welcome Jim Bittner. Jim. Uh, good afternoon. I'm pleased to be here today. While I'm no longer active on the board, I gotta share my webcam, I think. First, I guess I'm off. There we are. There we are. I'll start again. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to be here today. While I'm no longer an active member of the Board of Farm Viability, I remain a strong supporter of the organization, and I'm happy to be able to continue to review proposals as a fruit farmer. My family farm specializes in growing fruit, apples, peaches, and cherries. We're up in Niagara County. We have about 400 acres of fruit. When I started working in fruit in 1988, I took over other operations of existing orchards. Back then the trees were 12 to 22 feet apart in the row, rows were 16 to 22 feet apart. We joked we could land an airplane in some of those old orchards. When I started planting some orchards of my own in 1987, we started planting trees closer together. At the time, we thought we were pretty brave, planting trees with rows 14 feet apart and the trees were six feet apart in the row. We were interested in planting higher densities, but we're not sure if it made economic sense or if we could handle these trees planted closer together. Uh, Dr. Terrence Robinson had been developing the tall spindle apple system at the Cornell Orchards in Geneva, and many of us have been watching his work to see if it would bear fruit. Yes, the pun is intended. Even though it looked promising as growers and the researchers knew that success of a high density orchard at a research farm is not a guarantee of success in a commercial orchard. Some of us had seen other new growing systems that looked pretty good in their early years, but turned out to be unmanageable as they got older. We said they looked like cute puppies when they were young, but some of them, a lot of them grew up to be ugly dogs. That's why the Farm Viability Panel was pleased to see a proposal from Terrence submitted to our program in 
2006. This was the proposal. This was the original proposal. Uh, response to the early proposal by the review panel was mixed. Truthfully, while some growers were very interested in seeing this work move forward, a minority of the growers just didn't see how to apply to them. <clears throat> the projects were really never number one priority to view for the review panels when we first started out. But over time, the more work that Terrence did, and the more work that it turned out to be the more work the farmers wanted to see. By 2013, comments like these started to show up from the review panels. That year, the proposal was the number one priority for the review panel. In all, the Farm Viability Board and the Farm Review Panels have supported eight projects from Terrence and his team. Six have been completed. One is just getting started in specialty crops and one is planning to get started this spring. I think Terrence has been successful in his applications because quite frankly, he thinks like a farmer. While his horticultural expertise in plant physiology is unmatched, he is as interested in the return on investment as he is the science. He's deeply committed to the applied research and the strong partnerships with growers all over New York State. Quite simply, he knows the practice needs to work on my farm, my orchard, my growing conditions, and my management ability. He's also been successful, besides being successful in getting farm viability funding, he's had a, a YouTube channel since 2015 of some of his work. His fruit schools have been standing room only, and his outreach didn't just generate interest from New York farmers to adopt fall spinel, but interest around the, around the world, actually. Every year, more and more acreage in New York State has been converted to this system with also at the same time changing over to new varieties. And almost every year, the grower community would be delighted to see where Terrence was going next with his science. And he and his team has worked to fine tune and optimize the system. They were able to do this because of their strong presence in New York orchards where they would talk to growers and see firsthand the opportunities to create more efficient systems. It's been much more than a trellis system. Terrence's team has taught us weather models, or I should say brought us weather models, fertigation and irrigation systems, crop load management tools, and working with his colleagues on the right root stocks to base this all on. At Bittner Singer Orchards, based on the work for, at Cornell, we now plant our trees a minimum of three feet apart in the row, and our rows are a maximum of 12 feet apart. This means there are 10 times as many trees per acre in our new plantings versus some of the orchards I was farming just a few short years ago. What's critical to understand is these trellis systems don't just benefit me in the first year of planting when they start to bear fruit. This production system and the knowledge of how to optimize it benefits my orchards every year, allowing me to produce more New York apples without expanding my acreage. Many of you know that farm viability requires project leaders to measure the economic impact and provide numbers in their final report. The work done by Terrence and his team has documented $31 million of impact for farmers that have adopted this practice. That's measured through increased revenue, cost savings, and capital investment. If you combine the six projects, there's been an investment of around $675,000 into Terrence's work. It's really a pretty remarkable return on investment. Now, of course, Farm Viability Institute has not been the only supporter. The New York Apple Research and Development Program, the Department of Agriculture and Markets in New York State, have all provided funding for Terrence's work. And I'm pleased to share that Terrence and his team have recently been awarded nearly $5 million USDA grant to continue to work on efficient and profitable planting systems for apple growers. Terrence joined Cornell in 1984. He is a research and extension professor at Cornell's Geneva Experimental Station. I guess we're supposed to call that Ag Tech today. And he leads Cornell's program in high density orchards, irrigation, and plant growth regulators. Uh, Terrence has been recognized around the world for his contributions to plant physiology, 
and in 2015 was inducted into the International Tree Fruit Association Hall of Fame. He is joining us to today to share his perspective on why farmers across New York have been willing to make such significant changes in their apple orchard. I'm pleased to hand the screen over to my friend, Dr. Terrence Robinson. Thank you, Jim. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a uh, Appreciate all those kind words, Jim, and for the support of the New York Farm Viability Institute over the years. Um, when Aileen uh, proposed this uh, webinar to me, I thought it would be very interesting to try to go back and think about why this program was successful. And so the title of the presentation is, Why Did They Do It? Exploring New York's Transition to the Tall Spindle Apple Orchard. I have my name as the author of this presentation, but there are many, many other people that worked with me and are part of our team, and I'll mention them throughout the presentation. I do want to acknowledge that working for Cornell University is one of the greatest uh, blessings in my life. It's a wonderful place to work because it's a great university, but not only that, the Apple industry in New York is just a wonderful group of people to work with, and they're collegial, friendly, and I consider every one of them my friends. I also want to acknowledge that the growers themselves impose a tax on themselves every year to fund research, and that's sent through the State Department of Ag and Markets, and it's called ARDP, or Apple Research and Development Program. There's a farmer-led board there that decides which projects to fund, and they have funded me consistently since their inception in 1991. And I appreciate Farm Viability's support to beginning in 2006, when they first came on the scene. Let me try to talk about uh, why this happened. It's been quite dramatic, the change in orchards in New York State over the last 50, 60 years. The picture on the left is when I arrived with many, many trees of this style. That's a picture of the younger Terrence Robinson. <clears throat> and then on the right is a picture of what orchards look like now. In the early years, in 50s and 60s, orchards were planted at only 40 trees to the acre. Now they're planted at 1,200 to 2,000 trees per acre. <clears throat> Why did that happen? <clears throat> well, it's been a continual evolution, but one of the key uh, transition points happened in 1998. The world apple industry went through a crisis of what many thought was overproduction and low prices. It led to quite a discouraging situation for growers and how would we get out of it? And in addition, there was a changing preference for varieties and the traditional varieties were decreasing in their de demand and other newer varieties were increasing. And so that crisis forced uh, changes. And so one comment from growers about why they made this transition was that they were going to rip out orchards anyway. And so what was the best way to replant them? And another grower commented at that point, our backs were up against the wall. Lastly, traditional orchards shown by the picture on the lower left side are very inefficient. That's a relatively young, low density orchard of a five years old. It has few apples on it, but it hasn't filled its space. The trees have to grow for many more years before they get big enough to fill the space. And often you didn't get maximum yields till after year 10. The picture on the right shows one of those trees when it's fully grown and it's very productive. But still, as Jim Bettner indicated, the space was so wide you could land an airplane. Now, from an economic perspective, that's very costly to make an investment and wait many, many years for any return. <clears throat> now, a second reason why things changed is that newer high density systems were able to show a way to get around three fundamental problems that affect apple production. The first fundamental issue is this long time period between planting and commercial production. Even with the technology that many growers were using in the 80s and 90s, it took six to seven years to get high or reasonable production from a new orchard. 
And so during that period of time, you kept paying interest on the investment with no return. But new high density orchards showed that we could reduce that time to two to three years, which drastically improved cash flow when you replanted, and especially when you planted to more profitable varieties, which started out being Galen, Fuji, and then Honeycrisp, which is now the most profitable variety. <clears throat> A second fundamental problem that high density systems allowed us to improve upon was that they inherently can produce higher mature yields. In the past, when I moved here, the bushel target or yield target was about a thousand bushels to the acre. But these newer systems are routinely at 1,200 and up to 1,500 bushels to the acre. And a third issue, which is really driven by the market, the market was demanding better fruit quality, better taste, better color, better condition. And these high density systems as shown in the bottom picture on the right, produce uniform fruit of excellent fruit color. And so this also helped improve crop value. So with those fundamental factors causing change within the industry, I wanna focus next on what we did to try to help. One of the things we did, which is a very simple thing, we really worked to understand how we could get trees to begin production in the second year and in the third year. And there were two key factors. That One of them was shown in the picture on the right. This is the way we used to deal with trees when we planted them. We would cut the central trunk. We would cut each of the side branches. Sometimes we would cut them back to just a simple vertical trunk with nothing left on it but that pruning delays production. And so just changing that one practice and learning how to grow what we call feathered trees shown in the middle picture, where we have many, many little side branches already at planting, allowed us to move towards what we currently call the instant orchard. No pruning at planting with many small side branches results in the picture on the right. When you combine that type of tree with productive rootstocks, you can get apples in the second year which is shown there in the last picture. <clears throat> that led us to these sorts of ideas to try to help growers replant. I show here the same picture that I showed on the right, which is a tree of Fuji on a new Geneva rootstock. And in the second year, because it was a very large tree of planting, it produced 85 fruits. And when you multiply that times very high planting density, that was already a full commercial yield of 950 bushels of the acre in the second year. This led us then to put targets out for New York growers of those different amounts in the second, third, and fourth, and fifth years. And if we could produce over the first five years, 3,000 or 3,000 total bushels, we could essentially pay for the entire investment in a new orchard in the first five years. Now, later I'm gonna talk about our extension efforts, but right now I'll just interject this small little, I don't know, humorous thing I would try to do when I would give this presentation, I would challenge any grower to keep track of the yields on new orchards. And if they could achieve these targets, I would buy them a steak dinner. Well, I've never bought anybody a steak dinner, but many people have achieved these target yields but they've never come to claim their steak dinner. Probably they know I'm just a poor little professor. But it helped to try to convince people that they could achieve these sorts of targets. Number two, a second important thing that we did was we developed a new method of pruning to manage the canopies at close in row spacings, and it's called branch renewal pruning. Jim Bittner has previously said they have tried high density plantings, but they then became unmanageable and became the ugly dog, although they start out as cute puppies. This picture shows what a tall spindle tree ends up looking like at maturity. When you use branch renewal pruning, every year you cut out two or three of the largest branches, and when you repeat that year after year after year, the tree doesn't have any large branches. It has a central trunk with only small branches, which you can continue to manage in relatively close spacings. This concept of a tree without structural branches was revolutionary and could hard, it took me a while to try to get my arms around it, but it still results in the basis of what we do today with tall spindle orchards. 
The third thing that we did was the, on the economic side. We built a very strong economic case to change to high density production systems. There was a lot of hesitancy, primarily because planting an orchard, it means you invest on the year of planting and even before, and then you wait many years to get a return. And so we were asking people to invest more upfront and would the return justify such massive initial investments? So what we did based on work we've been supported by Apple Research and Development Board, we summarized 20 years of our orchard trial data and consolidated all of that work into five systems of merit. And then we evaluated their economic potential. And I have to acknowledge that this work was all done with really strong support from ARDP before uh, farm viability came into existence. One of the critical results with this figure from a trial that I ran for almost 20 years, I could show that as you increase tree planting density on the horizontal x-axis, on the y-axis, you see greater and greater cumulative yield. If you just focus on the black line, which is GALA, at low density, it would have accumulated 320 tons per hectare, but at the highest density, it would have accumulated more than 700 tons, so essentially twice as much yield over the 20 year life of an orchard than at lower densities. This increased yield coupled with the increased early yield allows the economics to work for this system. So in 2003, we, uh, at the, the urging of a very wonderful apple grower and friend who passed away recently, uh, George Lamont, who led an industry-wide uh, strategic planning we did this economic study with two colleagues uh, in extension, Allison DeMarie from Wayne County, who was an extension economist in Lake Ontario region, and Steve Hoyne, who was a horticultural extension person. And we did this evaluation on these five systems, and you see on the left what we expected their yields to be for each year over 20 year life of an orchard. But on the right, more importantly, you see the cash flows. And you see that the blue line is the low density system. It requires a substantial amount of money to plant the orchard, but then you keep investing for several years before it turns around. And it doesn't reach the zero line until about year 14. The high density systems in contrast require more upfront initial investment, but reach the zero line at year 10 in terms of a net present value cash flow. And when we put all that together, we came up with this black line in 2003, and we redid the analysis in 2010 with a red line, which showed that if you plant low density in New York, you could be profitable, but relatively low profitability. But if you increase tree density up to somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 trees per acre, you could maximize profitability. Planting more trees per acre than that did not generally give you greater profitability. So that, this very important result indicated that the entire New York industry should increase tree planting density from the two to 300 trees per acre of the 60s and 70s and 80s to more than a thousand trees per acre. And if they did that, their profitability would more than double. <clears throat> so then we put together all of the pieces for this new system uh, in terms of its horticulture, how to plant it, how to manage it, and what to, trees to start with. And the principles of the tall spindle system are all based upon that previous research, which is the best economic density. And then secondly, how to get this high early production and the steak dinner that I had promised people if they could achieve it. And it involves using these highly branched feathered trees and minimal pruning then how to get high mature yields, and that requires you to grow the tree tall. That's hence the name tall spindle. If you maintain the tree at six feet so you can pick it off from the ground, you don't get these kind of yields. But going up to 10, 11, or 12 feet, you could get very, very high yields. But since it was very narrow, you get very high fruit quality because of good light distribution within the canopy. It has no permanent branches and uses limb renewal pruning every year to keep the branches small and weak and balance vigor so it doesn't outgrow its space. As we worked with this system, we realized that it could be pruned in a very simple way. And we met, made three simple rules we, teach, we taught repeatedly to growers or to their workers. And people can 
learn to prune this system very easily. But also importantly, because it's a very narrow system, it can be partially mechanized in terms of pruning and tree taining with a reduction in labor costs, which I'll show a little bit later. Here are two pictures of tall spindle orchards with very high yields at maturity and with very narrow canopies and the high quality that, of fruit that you get. That led us to 2006 to write a proposal to the newly organized Farm Viability Organization. We were convinced that the tall spindle was a system of the future and would put New York growers in a strong and competitive position worldwide. But we had few converts. So our project involved continuing to refine the details of the tall spindle system, but also to launch a major push for adoption. I'll go through a little bit of the details in a minute, but just want to present what happened. The net results were that the number of tall spindle growers grew from around five in 2007 to almost all growers in 2013. There's still some growers who focus on the non-fresh, the processing side of applesauce and apple juice that haven't adopted this, but almost all growers in the fresh fruit market have adopted this since 2013. It also led to very large reinvestments in new orchards with more profitable varieties. And maybe that last part with more profitable varieties like Honeycrisp has been the biggest factor influencing the current health and profitability of the New York apple industry. There's about 50,000 acres of apples in New York State. I estimate that 25 to 30,000 of those acres have been replanted at Tall Spindle now. <clears throat> the multi pronged extension approach that we took to um, move forward the adoption of Tall Spindle through the Farm Viability Grant was to consistently focus on the economic benefits of adopting tall spindle. We had a very strong economic case, even though it required massive upfront inputs of cash. To help with this, we gave at least two times in my career uh, seminars to farm credit people. And I hope that some of the things we said helped them see that lending money to farmers to plant new tall spindle orchards with high value varieties was the only way for the apple industry to move forward and they supported it 100% and has resulted in this massive adoption of this uh, concept. We used on-farm demonstrations and I have to thank many farmers who let us plant multi-acre demonstration plots where we demonstrated the poor now, the old fashioned system against the new systems. And we really appreciate the years and years that they would manage these plots on their farm to um, help generate enthusiasm. We relied on early adopters as advocates for this and farmers often see what their neighbors doing. And when they saw their neighbor planting this, they did too. We conducted four or five in-depth schools in those years between 2007 and 2013, where we taught all aspects from economics to management of the tall spindle. We published articles in the Fruit Grower magazines, that's Fruit Quarterly magazine newsletters, I gave numerous field day presentations and numerous pruning demonstrations because the greatest, one of the greatest hesitancy after the economics was, will I be able to manage this tree or will it get too wild on me? And teaching them how to prune in this simple limb renewal system helped allay many fears. I also gave provocative previous presentations. You know, I already mentioned the second point, my steak dinner challenge, but I titled one of my presentations, the tall spindle, the path to becoming fabulously wealthy. And I hope that it has made growers a lot of money. Success generated success. And as growers had great results for the tall spindle, then it was widely, widely adopted. And here you see two pictures of just fabulous tall spindle orchards with very, very high yields and excellent fruit quality. We've continued and as um, Jim Bittner indicated, we have had a success successive series of farm viability projects, each on a slightly different aspect. And in 2013, we pulled together a concept of having um, a new vision for orchards that included all of the aspects of tall spindle, but new rootstocks, new varieties, but also reduced labor for orchards of the future. And those kind of pieces of that have been funded by farm viability. <clears throat> Just focus for a moment on one aspect of that, and that is we had a project on trying to reduce labor costs. 
And here I show a comparison of annual labor inputs for more a traditional semi-dwarf orchard system, the first column. And rather than talk about all of the different categories of expenses, it would require about 300 man hours per acre in labor costs. The tall spindle can produce higher yields, but requires less hours. And so it would require a total of little more than half the number of hours per acre in man hours. And so you see there on the bottom, a picture on the left with the ladders and the expensive way to pick fruit. And then on the right, you see a, a tall spindle orchard that could potentially be picked from platforms, which reduce labor costs. I guess in conclusion, it's been really fun for me to think back about the factors that uh, made this effort successful. I am very, very proud of the New York apple industry. They adopted this faster than other states. And, and, and because of that, I think I've had a competitive advantage. It's the tall spindle is now being planted by almost all New York apple growers. As a consequence of the system, plus maybe more importantly, profitable varieties, high value varieties. I think the apple industry is profitable, vibrant, and very competitive on the world stage. The industry continues to make very large reinvestments in new high density orchards, but not only that, in new packaging plants and new store apple storage buildings. We continue to try to optimize the tall spindle by reducing costs with partial mechanization to help the apple industry remain competitive and profitable. The funding we received from the Farm Viability initially in 2006 and has continued almost every year in different aspects of this has been an important element in keeping the New York apple industry strong. And I thank the state for having the vision, well, the growers who first proposed this to the state, and then the state for funding this organization to help keep New York agriculture viable and profitable. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention and be happy to talk about any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Terrence. Um, and I think we're going to bring Jim back as well. I think that's, that's the idea here. So um, if uh, anybody has questions, uh, type them into the chat. I'm not sure if I receive questions or not. Somebody might need to forward them to me. Um, so uh, first question that's come in here, was there ever a, an issue during the research of the branches being too small, not strong enough to hold the weight of the apples? Well, that's really an interesting question because all of us, including Jim, myself, anybody that's our age, grew up with the idea of having strong branches, structural branches in an apple tree to support the load. And so we couldn't conceive of an apple tree without scaffold branches, as we call them. But as we moved trees so close together, we found that just these short, small branches would fill the space. And they don't have to be structurally strong because they only have to hold four or five apples. So we theorized that with an, a tall spindle tree has to have about 20 of these branches. You put five apples on each of those branches, you have your 100 apples. And 100 apples on a tall spindle tree gives a very, very high yield. And so it's just such a change in, in thinking about an apple tree that you don't need structural scaffold branches. Great. So uh, another question here, it just, getting a little bit back to the, the um, notion of this whole series is why farmers adopt or don't adopt uh, technology. Um, and, um, and, I, and I recall some comments early on when we first started funding these projects. And I'm wondering, were there growers who, who did or, 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 or even still do resist uh, changing the tall spindle? And can you comment a little bit more about why they don't move uh, to the tall spindle system? It's been a, such an interesting journey. Um, there have always been some growers in New York that are so forward thinking they would jump at anything we talked about in high density and in many cases were ahead of us. But there are some growers that have been really, really resistant. Early in my career, I uh, tried to convince a grower in a particular, I'm not going to even mention the part of the state because I don't want anybody to have, but he is a very important grower. 
and he said, uh, you know, I'm really happy with this uh, 11 by 22 spacing that I use, and I'm never going to change. And he was about my age. But somewhere around 2011, he started planting tall spindle. And that's all he plants now. And it's been so interesting to see the children of that grower come in and they've grown up that this is the way to do things. And, and that's just been a very gratifying uh, way things have turned out that almost all growers who are negative in the beginning have come around. Now I will add that there's a segment of the apple industry that is not focused on the fresh market and grows apples exclusively for applesauce and processing. There, they have not changed as well. But we decided about a year ago to launch a new extension push to try to get more buy-in from that segment of the industry. Their concern is the high, high initial investment with Tall Spindle, but the prices they receive for processing fruit are not very high. And so they wonder whether the economics could really justify it because the economics in the fresh market are clear but it's based on fresh fruit prices that are much higher than processed fruit prices. I hope that in the next few years, we'll convince many of them to replant older orchards because our land base, our orchard base for the processing industry is getting old. It needs to be renovated, it needs to be modernized. And so I'd say, Dave, I don't know of any growers that are really, really against this now, but some wonder whether they can pay for it and some farms just don't have the liquidity to make this move. And it's unfortunate that some people get in position as they get older, they haven't replanted, and their debt is way up from some bad decisions or bad crops, and then the financial institutions can't support it. But I do have to say again, farm credit has been extremely supportive and allowed the vast majority of growers to make the leap. Jim, Jim, a question for you. Looking back, in, in hindsight, would you have done anything different in terms of your movement to tall spindles? Myself, personally, and I'll bet you most, the average grower will say they wish they'd done it sooner. Um, one of the problems with this system is it, it takes a big financial investment. And if you don't have the cash flow or the, lend, or the borrowing capacity to get that money to invest it, you're in trouble. And I think that's, that, and for us, that's our, our biggest problem is we didn't, we, I wish we would have started four or five years sooner, uh, but we, we resisted, uh, especially when you start talking about spending, you know, $20,000 to plant an acre of, of orchard. It's, it, but it comes to a point you just can't you can't ignore the economics. It's so strong. You just look at it and you say, I either got to do this or I'm not going to be in the Apple business 10, 15 years from now. Yeah. Okay. So um, another question has come in here. Well, actually, a lot of questions have come in. So um, do high density systems work in any size farm or planting? Or is there some uh, minimum acreage or min minimum size that would take to make it work? Oh, it's, I'll answer that. No. <laughs> if a person's got five acres, it ought to be five acres of high density planting. Really, the only place it doesn't work is if a place is as you pick, because as Terrence said, you need tall, you need 10 foot trees and you're not gonna send you pickers up ladders. But I know you pick operations that have planted this and they're picking the tops of the trees on a platform for the packer and they're letting you pickers pick the bottoms of trees. And there's ways of doing it. But um, size is not a, I, I don't see it as a problem. I want to add to that one of the my passions in life is helping family farms and one of the reasons I love New York is that our farm base is still family farm not corporate farms and other places uh, they've gone to more corporate farms and I don't find as much enjoyment out of that but this system helps every family farm whether small or big in New York State it's not size defined 
Great. So uh, also, Terrence or, or Jim, uh, I suppose, if, if you have some opinions about it, but can you talk a little bit more about um, the consumer preferences and the role that it played in uh, or, or maybe continues to play in Tall Spindle and, and the decision to, uh, to go that direction for a grower? I'll comment first, then you can add, Jim, is that over my almost 40 years in New York, I never thought that the traditional varieties would ever disappear. And it seemed like they just were hanging in there, Macintosh and Cortland, um, for many, many, many years. Empire became almost our number one variety, developed at the Geneva Station by a wonderful apple breeder named Roger Way. And then starting around 2005 to 2010, I started to see some signs that maybe that wasn't true. I did take a leave from Cornell from 2015 to 2018 to go serve a mission in Mexico with my church. What shocked me when I came back is how the market for traditional varieties, particularly Macintosh and Empire, almost evaporated completely. And that was a drastic shock to the New York apple industry. It was driven by consumers who liked Honeycrisp better or who liked uh, Gala better or Fuji or other newer varieties for us. And that has been a huge upheaval to the New York apple industry, forcing the removal of many acres of Empire or Macintosh and then replanting. But the benefit of the high density system is if, as Jim said, you had the financial wherewithal to replant, you could replant and be back into production with newer, more profitable varieties in relatively short period of time. If we had had to go through the old style of doing it, we would plant new orchards, but we still wouldn't have the production. So the, the changing market has been a huge factor for the New York apple industry. I personally am very proud of the New York industry that, that many of them were forward thinking and already were planting leading edge systems and varieties so that when the big downturn in Macintosh and Empire demand happened, we were still pretty pretty well positioned and it has not caused the bankruptcy of wholesale bankruptcy of the New York industry. Jim, anything to add to that? Well, today the, the variety issue is huge. As a farmer, we sit here, we don't know what to plant. We made money on empires. No one, you can't plant empire today. I'm down to 20 Macintosh trees on my entire farm. And that's only because it finishes out a row. Uh, there's no gold delicious left. We're cutting down red delicious. Unfortunately, this, this farm that I took over was based on red delicious. And I can grow a beautiful red delicious high yields. I'm losing my shirt on red delicious. Um, but the question is what to plant next. Um, it's quite a, uh, it's real dilemma right now. I mean, there always used to be something new and improved that we could, we would look at planting. And right now it's, it's really a question mark. And, of what what to plant. I mean, you know, Gala, Fuji, Honeycrisp. Can you get in on one of the managed varieties? Um, it's it's a it's a tough thing. But you so, but whatever you but whatever you plant for a variety, it's going to be on a high density system. That's a given. So uh, um, one one last question here. So in in, in terms of, of, of agricultural challenges and, and research needs, and many of those needs are, are a lot greater than any one organization can fund. And, and I wonder if you could comment a little bit about farm viability's role and, and, the, and the broader collaboration of, and support of different organizations uh, to, to fund agricultural research, not just this apple research, but, but even more broadly. Well, Jim, you were part of the organization of this, but let me go first and just say that uh, to me, this is a wonderful idea. I didn't dream up the idea of farm viability, but once I heard it, I thought, wow, what a wonderful thing, because universities have changed. They, luckily, New York State still supports Cornell University that pays my salary, so I can exist as a research professor, but I don't have any money to do any work to pay technicians to do the projects unless I get it from outside sources. And one of the beauties of New York State is that we've had this grower-funded self-tax 
Apple Research and Development Board that's helped a lot, but it helped only the apple growers. And so when farm viability was proposed to the state, I thought it's, it's a great idea because it would broadly support New York agriculture on practical projects that could have an impact on keeping agriculture viable in New York State. So I salute the state for their uh, commitment to New York agriculture and to the Farm Viability Board for working to help keep the agriculture going strong. It's made a big difference in the apple industry. I'm less familiar with impacts in other commodities, but from what I've heard, it's been great as well. So back to you, Jim. Well, you know, the thing is, it's been farmer led. Farmers have decided how they're going to see the money spent, what was in, what's important to them. And that's just huge. So, you know, the farmers have to buy into it. The whatever is going to be funded, the farmers have supported it and says, yeah, we need this information. Or we, we need this project done. And that's huge. There's no other, you know, outfit that does it that way. And also, a lot of researchers like Terrence don't have to pen just on one source. You can stack things. You can say, okay, this uh, ADRP is going to buy the trees to fund more long-term stuff because farm viabilities look more at the short-term stuff. And you can put packages together to get the work done. So then farm viability, I think, is an important part of that cog. And the other thing is, you know, not just the apples. Other things were something new and that needs, all, it needs attention. It's all of a sudden, whether it's, you know, barley or hops or something that just came out of the woodwork that all of a sudden needs attention, farm viability can do that. Whereas you're not going to start up a new research and development grower paid thing for that. Or maybe it's not going to get into the state budget quick enough, but farm viability can prime the pump and get it going. Great, thank you. Well, th thanks to both of you for your, your uh, presentations and for your insights. I really appreciate that. We have other questions, but unfortunately we need to, to move on to stay within the time frame of the program. So thanks, Terrence, and, and thanks, Jim. You're welcome. Wow. So, so the, the uh, I want to move on with the program now. One of the things that Farm Viability is very focused on is is funding projects that address the highest priority farmer-identified applied research and education needs. And I think you heard that quite a bit from Terrence and Jim. And and we do that in several ways. First, we ask the applicants to describe how they're going to actually identify and and focus their, how they're going to identify the uh, the focus of the project and how it was was uh, getting tangled up in my words here, how it was uh, defined as or how they has, um, found out that it was a high priority for farmers. And then we utilize farmer review panels to evaluate and rank the proposals that we receive. And then we have an all farmer board of directors who makes the funding decisions. And then to facilitate those three things, we bring farmers together to participate in focus group discussions or surveys to identify the highest priority needs within their industry. And then we share those results with uh, of, of those needs assessments with researchers, educators, and policymakers. Last summer, uh, Eileen Randolph on our staff here at Farm Viability led an effort to conduct such an assessment in the apple industry. So I'd like to turn it over now to Eileen to talk about some of the results of that um, survey and, and that uh, barrier identification work. Okay, everything working? Want to give me a thumbs up, Dave? Yep, looks good. Okay, uh, I'm going to take you through some quantitative research we did last summer among apple growers, and I'm going to uh, this re this slide presentation is being recorded, and the slides will also be posted on our website. So I'm not going to try and milk every slide. I'm going to really just try and kind of make sure you understand what we did and what the, what the, how to read the slides so you can look at it deeper uh, later, later on at your own uh, uh, pace. Um, and my keyboard is not advancing. I had problems with it earlier today. I don't know what I did. All right, let me try the mouse. 
Okay, sorry about that. Um, quick background, uh, when you're doing a quantitative survey, you have to make sure you're asking the right questions. And so we relied on uh, Jill McKenzie, who uh, unfortunately was her video that didn't, didn't play well earlier, but she is a real asset to the Farm Viability Board representing the New York Horticultural Society. And she helped us put together a survey that would really give us the, the right questions to ask. We also asked the ARDP committee chair to take a look at it as well to make sure we were staying on track with them. We conducted it last summer. Uh, we reached out through email uh, through the New York State Apple Growers Association because they managed the over, overall list of growers who participate in the ARDP program and we were seeking the input of commercial growers. Um, so in, in looking at who answered, we had a total of 68 respondents answer at least one question from the survey. Uh, this question was near the end of the survey and only 38 of the overall respondents chose to answer it. But we really, it's always important to know who is giving you information. So we, we wanted to know what the, what the size of their operation was and we break it out by different acreage. Uh, in that first category, more than 500 acres, um, we had uh, a 33% participation rate if you look at it against the 2017 census data. So I feel confident in um, understanding what the, the largest growers in the state have on their mind. We also had a, a, a reasonable representation rate in that 100 to 500 acreage um, with about a 33% representation there. As you go down to the smaller acreage though, the, the participation numbers in those categories can't really be broken out. So this presentation um, doesn't give you the breakouts of how different, different groups thought, but it tells you um, who, who, is, who is chiming in overall. Um, other characteristics about the respondents, um, it's a mix of Apple only and diversified operations. Um, by acreage, 50% of the respondents utilize 80% or more of their acreage to grow apples. Um, the larger acreage farms tend to be focused solely on apples. The smaller acreage farms tend to be more diversified. I thought it was really important that we understand because we're really about adoption, getting people to change their practices if the research bears uh, itself out uh, to understand who who they go to for support on the so 74% of the respondents have worked with a professional crop advisor 92% had utilized uh, in a CCE program or their direct guidance so another important piece of information uh, this one's kind of fun market opportunities we also do accept proposals that aren't looking necessarily at production research but and um, you know, what should be pe what should people people be doing in direct in direct market or uh, a you pick kind of stuff? So a little bit uh, you got to take a minute to think about how to read this. The the purple and red, so the bar the the bars on your furthest left are ex that saying that they are extremely likely or somewhat likely to consider these business opportunities. That pink thing in the middle says, well, I'm already doing that. The blue bar sh says, hey, I hadn't previously considered that. I consider the blue bar the persuadable group because the green and the yellow, they've kind of made up their mind that that, that market is not for them, uh, saying that it's somewhat unlikely or extremely unlikely. And so the categories that we looked at were uh, export markets. You can see, um, some people are definitely thinking about it, um, whereas others say it's not for them. You know, and uh, organic certification, you'll see that the number down there is, is lower. That's organic apples are very difficult to grow in New York State, as Jim Bittner can tell you. Uh, you know, so all of these different things, you can, you can look at this on your own, but that, that's how to read it. And I think it's kind of interesting because if you're thinking about new ideas for the Apple industry, um, this, this gives you a sense of uh, what, what the industry is already considering. 
We also like to get a, an understanding of how they're feeling about their own farm and the farm situation. And we ask this question across um, pretty much all our commodities. And uh, so what we say, you know, you know, we, we make them think about what they're doing in terms of, is it a production uh, problem? Is it a market problem? How does it fit in? So some people, 13%, I can sell more product than I can sell. So there's a market problem, but, uh, you know, so that's the, some of the market opportunities might be the answer there. I can sell what I grow, but I'm not making much money. That's where work like Terrence's is so important because it's about efficiency uh, at that point in time. And then some people say, hey, you know what? I can sell what I grow and the business has a reasonable profit. So all, all different um, places on where people's thought processes can be. A few of them were none of the above, which can also make sense. Um, and, but we did, uh, because we, we give people the opportunity to give us some responses on open-ended if they checked that not making, not making enough, any money, um, we wanted to know what was limiting their, their, what they thought was limiting their profits there. Um, not surprising to see labor costs, um, cost, you know, competition from states with a lower cost of production. Uh, the older varieties is, is something we've already spoken about and uh, an understanding that, you know, you've got to you got to move where the market's going. Um, but of course, you move where the market's going and then you, people are saying, but now there's too many club varieties. I don't, you know, so it's all a balancing act. Um, it was disturbing to see this second to last one that, you know, larger companies dumping product and dropping prices can't can't do a lot there. Uh, and then that consumer um, is again, always part of the puzzle. Okay, so this chart is the only question we asked in this format. And so I wanna make sure you understand kind of what our format was. We really, either we looked at it and thought that there were five buckets of work or five categories of work that we, um, that we see proposals come in and um, that the problems and opportunities are grouped in. Improving harvest and storage processes, understanding the value of new technology, optimizing orchard management practices, uh, labor management, food safety and marketing, and then the managing diseases, insects, pests, and weeds. So rather than get down to the very granular problem, the first question we asked the respondents at the beginning of the survey was, if you had 100 points, how would you allocate them among these categories? It was interesting to note that um, people spread the money out. There, there were, um, you know, everything is important. Um, that you can see that they did put a higher level of importance or more points against those two categories down there on the bottom. So this type of information is real important for us to know because we see proposals that come in that are beautifully written, well done work plans, all of that, but we just have to know, is it a problem that's really important to growers? And so this helps us kind of um, filter some of those thought processes, as does our application design. So now we're going to go through some slides that look at this um, on a category by category basis. This is the category that folks thought was the most important, the disease and pest challenges. Uh, fire blight, these are grouped by the top three most important and the three least important. This category had uh, a total of 11. So by looking at it this way, you can get a good sense of where the problems are and where things that just don't resonate with a lot of people are. So uh, we funded work in those top two. We have not seen as many proposals in Apple Scab. Uh, next one, management labor and food safety practices. Um, this is, you know, this is why Terrence's work is always so, so successful because uh, what they put in that management piece was understanding the economics of infield decisions at harvest, understanding the economics of other infield decisions. 
And again, this, this category works the same. It's only because there were fewer choices. I only grouped the top two and the bottom two. Uh, optimizing orchard practices. Uh, these uh, numbers kind of just show you, you know, three most important, three least important, and uh, we're already working in the irrigation and fertigation, I'm, I'm happy to say. Uh, harvest and storage was not a, as critical of a topic for folks, but once they were there, they knew what they wanted to see. They want to see the harvest timing management for optimal fruit quality as their uh, highest concern. Uh, I was surprised that the mechanization and labor efficiency didn't, didn't have that same split. Um, I, I don't know why that is uh, unless they They've been hearing about some stuff for a while and it needs to get to market. Uh, in terms of things getting to market, technology development, um, this category uh, was also, uh, it, it was in the, the bottom half of the category buckets. Um, but when you look at where they responded, it had, it had high levels of enthusiasm. The question was different here. We asked for what do you think has, um, it was high potential, some potential, limited potential, no, no potential, or I don't know. So um, the limited potential is not shown, it's your difference in the math. And here's the high and uh, some potential responses. Um, so always just interesting to see how some of the technology uh, that folks know how to develop or have ideas for may not be targeted to what growers see as their most pressing problems. Okay, I went through it as quick as I could. Um, I hope that that gave you a good sense of it. Um, I do plan to mine the data a little bit further and uh, we uh, can, if you're willing to stick around, I'm, I'm happy to answer some more questions here. Did anything come in? Okay. Um, and so if anybody has any questions, please uh, type it into the chat. That'd uh, be great. And then hopefully somebody will pass. I don't think I get those chats, so somebody will need to pass that along to me, I think. Um, yeah, Kyle uh, usually was, passes them on. Yeah, it, it was interesting to note uh, because in one of those sections, uh, farm, they, they talked about a high need being uh, in-field decision-making at harvest and in uh, and, and field decision. And then when I look at the the last chart that you showed, technology development, those things, you know, diagnostic tools, um, automation for pesticide application, biological solutions, a lot of those are, um, I think, it seems to me, relate heavily to that in-field decision support. So um, uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting study to sort of pick apart and, and see what all is in there. So um, not yeah, seeing... I'm, I'm... I'm hopeful that our Apple researchers uh, will really take a look at this and with their knowledge be able to uh, connect some of uh, what they what they see here quantitatively with what they hear in their conversations with with growers um, and uh, see what we can we can do there. Um, so that's kind of what it looks like and as I said it will be, available um, online uh, as a PDF file to download. And it will also, uh, we'll have the, the webinar will be recorded and we will share it. Uh, I am disappointed that we uh, weren't able to get the technology to work for Jill McKenzie's uh, video, but I'm sure that I can uh, upload it to our website uh, so it can be seen as well too. Uh, she's got a fabulous story about how as she and her husband uh, started a, a new orchard, it was really the orchard that uh, New York State funded research or farm viability funded research built because uh, they were able to know what they wanted to do from the outset and in looking at all the, the things that had been proven out over the last 20 years. So I do have a question that's come in here, uh, Eileen. 
uh, how did respondents feel about the need for internet connectivity within an orchard uh, or, or more general interconnectedness? Um, I don't know if there was this survey got to that or if you remember any responses in that respect. We, we did not um, ask about broadband uh, access in the, in the survey. Um, we, we asked uh, more on some of those tools, um, if they're familiar with what's being developed, then they understand that some of the tools will need that. Um, they sometimes things can be collected offline and then uploaded uh, back at the farm office. Um, but we did we didn't uh, look at that one specifically. Okay. So I well I want to take a minute to to um, thank Rob for or the chairman of our Farm Valuability Board for kicking off the program. Uh, thank Jim Bittner and Terrence Robinson for their presentations, and Eileen certainly for organizing the whole uh, webinar today's webinar but the, the webinar series I want to invite everybody to look at there we have two more webinars coming up that that will be quite interesting so check those out and register for them please and also um, special thanks to farm credit for their support of this webinar series and and Kyle Bell uh, the, the tech person at uh, farm credit who does a great job in helping us um, keep things straight and keep things moving forward. Unfortunately, we had a little technical difficulty this time around, but we'll get that fixed. And, and like Eileen said, hopefully we'll be able to put that up on our website. So you'll be able to come take a look at it if you would like. It's a really interesting video. Um, I enjoyed listening to it anyway. So again, I want to thank everybody for, for being on board with us. Thanks for your support of Farm Viability. If you have any questions, uh, you know where to find us. You can contact Eileen or I anytime here at the Farm Viability Institute. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon.